Hey there Golden Bears, how are we today? As you can see, Steger now is a little scruffy going on and I've made these post Christmas break so uh, this is what you'll deal for Module 7 and uh, I don't think you'll enjoy it but I have enjoyed not having to touch my beautiful face with any sort of razor. Well with that, let us kick off into what is Unit 7 essentially about? It's, if you understood, I've always compared how America has grown up and comparing it to like our bodies and who we are as a people. Um, is, is prior to the American Revolution, we were just little babies in diapers still. Post the revolution, we, we went from our diapers into you know training wheels, so to speak. And then as we continue to pro progress through, we've kept getting older and older. By the time we came to the Civil War, that is where our two uh, selves were fighting as adolescents, uh, you know, the teenage type of years. But now that we've come out of that, we've come out of the Gilded Age where we have now begun to drive and try to experience things on our own. Um, and in that, we've had some collision courses with things that were of the Labor Party and the issues of government and the people and things weren't well. We're now finding ourselves a module or unit seven, seven dealing with adulthood. Not adulthood in terms of like marriage. Uh, we're talking about adulthood going off kind of into college and kind of beyond the high school years. Essentially, Module 7 starts with us in 1898, uh, where we have the Spanish-American War, where America begins to kind of say, hmm, I think we're going to step into the realm of taking on other European powers for influence across the nation. And then it culminates with the end of World War II. And, and America uh, certainly comes to adulthood rather fast during these college years, if you will. And so we're going to be spending time talking about America's influence in that. Well, with that, let's jump into Module 7 1 and progressivism and social reform that we have there. Give me a moment while I get my screen set. It's not obeying to me right now. Um, I like to start with the story as usual, and, and we're dealing with progressivism. And this idea of progressivism is looking forward and not looking to the back to provide some solutions, but looking forward. And I, and I hearken back, um, I used to. Uh, be coach in, in, in many levels at, at our high school way back when I first started and and across the street or behind our campus is Linfield and my wife worked at Linfield for many years and she also coached on their softball team varsity softball and they actually did very well where they actually won and won a couple CIF rings uh, as with her and the other coaches on staff and there was a day in, in which at Linfield uh, the varsity baseball players were all talking smack and talking head and so finally the head coach of the softball team went to the head coach of the baseball team hey the end of the season why don't we have a competition to see if your boys can hit some of the pitches thrown by our girls and like oh, of course we'll do that and so sure enough the end of the season comes all the teams came out to watch this I kid you not there was barely one player if I remember two on the varsity baseball team that could hit uh, the girls who were throwing them because they were throwing at such velocity, such speed, and so much junk could be the ball movement, and the boys weren't so accustomed to being that close to where the pitcher was releasing the ball. It was awesome sight to see, and so I just share that with you as like a progressive sense of that women were, were taking their place and it certainly humbled the guys because they had no room to talk about that for the rest of the year while on campus and beyond. And it was kind of a cool thing as an adult seeing what had taken place here. This quote that you see here in front is, we are only the only animal species in which the female depends on the male for food. That is Charlotte Perkins Gilman. One of the progressive movements that take place during this time period is that of women are beginning to, not just beginning to speak out, but their voices are being heard a lot more. One of the persons even goes on and says, you know, they expect us to keep our mouths closed, but our wombs open. And so this is where we see the women's movement gaining steam and where they eventually, uh, by uh, 1918, 1919, are able to pass the 19th Amendment in order for them to get the opportunity to vote. They don't get equal rights that they were championing for, but they certainly got the opportunity to vote. Uh, let me turn on the volume here for a second. Um, this is going to be uh, the worksheet that you'll have to be working on. I'll talk about that more with my Steger Select Crip Posse here. So there are some things that we need to kind of keep mindful of as we go through this target. One, we're going to talk about the muckrakers or the journalists that are pointing out the the corruption and, and the misdeeds that both local and state and um, federal governments have been doing. We're going to 
begin seeing how the, there's this emerging middle class is going to be asking and demanding change. We're going to be talking about how um, new participatory government is happening at the local, we call it municipal levels. And we begin seeing also that there is a moral calling for Americans, predominantly the minorities and the South, to begin making some changes. So with that, let us kind of jump in to with this. Well, what are these roots of progressivism? But the progressivism is this mindset of an emerging middle class. They're used, the middle class part of this time was predominantly just the professionals, the doctors, the lawyers, the dentists. Um, what we have now emerging is it's no longer just limited to that, but because as factories have expanded and as factories expanded, they need to have more managerial type of people. And then this has enabled and, and, and grown um, the pocketbooks of uh, hundreds of thousands of people. Because of these middle class people, they're emerging to become more aware of how there's need for change across the nation with that. And so in the middle bullet, you'll see that, yes, yeah, some Americans had altruistic reasons for doing this, but others are saying, wait a minute, no, we're weary of seeing the disease and the crime and, and the threats to what they perceive to their cultural norms. And so progressivism is, is a desire to, to grow uh, towards a reform. I love this little thought bubble that I have at the bottom of there is the populist movement, if you remember the last prior time period, is dealing with only farmers primarily, okay, and, and they're what they need to strive for. They're like, the, they're the ones that are the outside looking in. They're the ones that are in Iowa wondering if, if, if DC, Washington DC and politics are gonna do anything for them. Progressives were like, oh no, we're on the inside and looking around for how, us, how we can bring about changes in, in the life uh, around us. Okay, the progressives were against a government that was not effectual. They were against capitalism that allowed the systems take place. Remember Adam Smith talked about this invisible hand that of capitalism that it will uh, allow the, the uh, production of forces to kind of rise and fall as they made and, and these monopolies would kind of control things and so they're against that. They believe that government should have a place or a role within controlling capitalism. What would be the result of this? That there would be less ups and downs or there wouldn't be the topsy turbiness that come with, with the panics and, and the growth uh, that, that capitalism can do. Another thing is that they pushed for this income tax that would kind of be more of a democratization across America. So basically if we eliminate tariffs, which would help industries, but we also as a government need to make money. They thought, why don't we begin coming up with taxes uh, that eventually get passed in the 18th Amendment, um, I believe the 18th, yeah, the 18th Amendment, um, and, and help balance out how government is done. And, and we still use this kind of graduated income tax to this today. And, and they also sensed that these reformers um, could, could kind of view their religious um, practices as a way of influencing uh, those around. Now, one key thing that I'll talk about in my social, in my Steger Select is this idea of populism and progressivism. You need to recognize that populism is from the last time period and, and think farmers. And they had a definite platform that they were operating for. Remember the Omaha platform, you're gonna to wanna to remember that. Whereas progressives are gonna have a completely different platform and you're gonna to wanna to look for La Follette and I'll try and talk about him, I think, in another chapter or two and, and the things that he was arguing for as well. Uh, here's a source uh, that we'll look at, class discussion that we will do. Um, some key people that you need to know that helped raise awareness of this progressive movement were the muckrakers. Now muckrakers is not a positive, affirming, affectionate term. Basically it means one who shits the, the crap and, and uh, uh, one who stirs up all the, the dirt, if you will. And, and so when different politicians came and, and gave quotes they would often mockingly cite who was great at this, famous at this, was Teddy Roosevelt. He just loved calling these people the muckrakers, stirring it up, okay? What they did is they often exposed corruption in the government. They often exposed the practices at the local, state levels that were ineffective what they were doing. And, and this helped raise the awareness of many in the middle class. And it was the middle class that was buying the various magazines and reading the various newspaper articles that were doing. And they also were like followers of Jacob Reese and, and Norris who wrote The Octopus. There's like four or five other key muckrakers there. What were they like? They were like the TMZ that you watch on, on now on television. I'm not saying that TMZ is, 
is like equal to a CBS or a CNN or uh, you know um, NPR. But I'll tell you what, there are people that listen to TMZ because they are there um, finding out information mostly about Hollywood people or you know other stars. But um, they've become somewhat of a quasi a legitimate group of people that are following um, Hollywood stars to see the latest you know gossip on them. So think of. Uh, the, the Reese and others as a legitimized TMZ that the government wants to dismiss as inappropriate, but many in America saw them as a reliable source for their truth. Now, in a prior time period, around I think chapter 6.7, we talked about Jane Addams and her friend Ellen Starr, and, and remember the whole house, and she was a wealthy woman who went off uh, after graduation and went and saw, I think in England, a house of where they took care of immigrants there and poor women. And so she says, why shouldn't we begin doing that there? And so um, as a progressive and as a female, she used her influence to start this whole house that eventually took shape in other parts of Chicago and other cities uh, around the U.S. I think close to 19 of them uh, modeled themselves after what she was doing. Now Jane Addams comes as a social gospel worker that she believes that her faith should be put into action and she was at the center of this social reform. But she also had some other quirky aspects of that she felt the role of women should be kind of in the home and relegated to the home. And so um, some feminists don't kind of advocate for her as being a true feminist, but she certainly was one who was meeting a need when the government was not uh, during this time. You see a rise of different uh, groups of women, both African-American and middle-class women that were beginning to form their own um, clubs. Why? And th these clubs were meant to create change within the political spectrum and change within their local communities. And here you see the NACW um, where they, they began finding ways if they couldn't live in the whole house. That's another reason Jane Addams really wasn't, she was appealing to the white uh, Americans. She didn't wasn't there to serve the needs of the African American community. So that's a you know a inconsistency about her message. But so here you have the African American. I'm like, well, fine. We'll create our own clubs and organizations that will provide for many of our own time and period. Now, as as we begin seeing women taking more of a center stage, both in terms of the the vote that they're longing for uh, and and the opportunity to have. The Equal Rights Amendment being passed, you see some unique things that they're arguing and collectivizing for. One of them is higher wages and going to an eight-hour workday. And out in little old Oregon, there was a, a court case that was upheld by the Supreme Court that basically said that women in Mueller versus Oregon would have a limited workday to 10 hours per day. Now that seemed like an incredible victory. But you know what? That comes back to haunt women uh, when we start talking about the civil rights movement in the 1960s and 70s um, because it kind of declares that women are lesser than rather than equal to, and that's going to hurt them later on. I'm just giving you a long-term glance in terms of the equal rights movement that will become very difficult for them in, in, in like I said, during the, the civil rights movement of the 1960s and 1970s. So that's why I said, was this a good or bad thing? Well, in, at the turn of the century here in the 1900s, this was a great thing because they began establishing rights for women, the needs that they needed to have in order to provide protection for their kids and for themselves at home. Well, uh, during this time, there's also a group of people who are emerging. Charlotte Perkins Gilman, the gal who I quoted at the beginning of this, she kind of was an author publishing documents that basically said women um, were not suited just for the home. They were suited for f far much more and that the women's reliance on the men was completely unnatural and, and not even uh, normal. And so she and other feminists began to gain access to the same um, opportunities as men and we're going to begin seeing uh, that Charlotte Perkins Gilman is going to begin linking up with other women in the, uh, that maybe were not feminists themselves but at least all saw the same uh, goal in mind. How can we have a chance to have something to say in terms of our opportunity to vote? And it is here that we what, what happens is ironically, I'm going to show you a map here shortly, is that certain parts of the states uh, adopt women's suffrage and, and give them the opportunity. For instance, out in the West, they're like, 
dude, we need as many women to vote as possible and the male vote to, as possible because if we ever wanted to go from a territory to become a statehood, we have to meet a certain threshold of people. And so you'll find on this next map that it was the West that actually gave women the right to vote. And then you're gonna find here on the East Coast, they're one of the late, last to adopt the idea for women to have an opportunity to vote uh, in America. And so whenever, just a sidebar, whenever you see the word suffragette, suffrages or suffragists, that is the same thing as in disenfranchised. And disenfranchised, what does that mean? Not able to vote. They love to just goof up and be all googly gooped on these exams. So it's your job when you see those words, recognize we're talking about the right to vote and the inequality of, of what women had during this time. So here's, here's a map that you'll see here is to notice that in purple were the last few groups where women were able to finally vote. And, and remember in 1918 um, or so is when the, it was passed that women were allowed to vote, but not all states ratified it, if I'm not mistaken, until 1919. But here on the West Coast, they completely uh, were offering women's right to vote long before the more established and most conservative South uh, there in America. I'm gonna kind of blast through this because uh, in your reading, it'll cover uh, both of these types of issues uh, there. There you see a picture uh, of women campaigning um, the suffragettes, if you will, trying to um, use tactics of uh, wondering, do, do, should women groups uh, put aside their differences? Um, you know, some are more conservative and see their role in the home only to be taking care of the kids and others are more feminist saying they should have a chance to have equal if more so to say than their husbands. They began putting aside those differences. What you will not find, however, is that many of the women movements were joining up with other African-American vote voters during this time and, and that is posing a problem for us a little bit uh, later on. Well, this progressivism then touches upon the racial equality and during in the South what made it very kind of unique and also very challenging is um, the women down in the South primarily, um, yes, they wanted to have a vote and wanted to say some things to vote and what their stance on it was is that if you give us the right to vote, husbands, that's more women voting who agree with you so that way we can make sure that the African-American voters will always remain disenfranchised and the whites will have more votes than the African-Americans as long as we continue doing the Jim Crow thing. And remember the Jim Crow laws were passed to keep them from, the, those are the poll taxes or they had to take different tests in, in order to do the local elections. And what did this do? it continued to subjugate the African-American votes and keeping them away from this. And so what we find out is that um, the women's equality approach in the North looked vastly different from the South. And in the North, they were fighting for their whites as white women in a, in a white man's world. In the South, they're actually trying to be women um, but keeping the rigid segregation in place and that that's how valuable their votes would be. So please pay attention as to how uh, the differences between the women movements were not the same between the North and the South. Moving on is gonna be a name that you need to be um, very, very familiar with and we're gonna do a compare and contrast between two of them. One is Booker T. Washington, a Harvard graduate, uh, as initially born as a slave, but I think at the age of nine, he was able to earn his, his his, his freedom for different by different factors. He, he went off and, and he sensed that um, what, what made his position not unique but approachable is that he says, why don't we do the right things all the time, have our character be of a high upstanding character, let us go to the best colleges and let's influence everything from the bottom and work our way up. Okay, and if we slowly work on our way up, we will gather the favor of the white people and they'll see us as contributors and see us as being accepted as equals to them. And so this gained a lot of acceptance, especially even like, for instance, Atlanta, Georgia, um, their governor and stuff just reached out to Booker T. Washington and said, this is a brilliant plan. Why is that brilliant? Well, it allowed the white people to continue doing whatever they wanted. And so there were many in the African-American community like, oh, give me time out, what? what? Um, you want us to sit here and just continue saying everything's good and chill, bro? Um, and we hope it'll be better for my kids or my grandkids? 
Um, so this is where we're going to begin seeing a divergence between even with the African American community, um, between Booker T. Washington and, and a few other type of people who opposed his views. Like for instance, Ida B. Wells, um, a woman who was born free, went off to college, uh, worked uh, for starting her own newspaper and then some horrible things happened to her newspaper because of inequality and lynchings and stuff. She eventually said, no, why do we have to wait for our day to, to kind of begin pressing against this? We need to begin fighting with a more intent in order to create the equality. And, and uh, so she's kind of like a middle ground. We're going to talk about another person here shortly called W.E.B. Dubois. Um, some call him Dubois, Dubois, I, I think it's Dubois in any way, but he demanded that every African American should have one, a first class citizenship, meaning they should have opportunity to go off to college, opportunity to in, 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 um, participate in politics, and begin the unique thing about um, Dubois and how he's different from um, Booker T. Washington is that he says, we should demand this immediately and we should begin changing the laws at the top. Okay, Washington saying, why don't we just quietly make the changes here at the local level? Hopefully it will trickle up or over a few generations to bring about harmony and racial change. Dubois is like, are you kidding me? The only way change is gonna happen is if it's forced from the top down. And so he started the NAACP. This is an organization that still to this day is used and is proud and is prolific and defends the rights of not just African-American people groups, but initially it was to create and challenging um, different jaw, um, sorry, court cases that had been passed at different local or, or uh, state levels. And even some of them, like Plessy versus Ferguson, they challenged uh, there in the American system. So the NAACP, you need to know and connect that uh, again back to Dubois and, and change it. So please be mindful that within the African American progressive movement, there wasn't one size that fits all, okay? That there were three different people groups or three different agendas that, that you need to be mindful. And then uh, also, we please don't lose sight that the American Indian, Native Indian population as well uh, were, were trying to be prolific in writing, some of them, uh, one from Arizona, uh, another one from Seneca, another one was a Sioux, in terms of trying to expose the practices of our government and how they've been treating them. And we talked about those uh, in this, prior to the Civil War in how, they, of course, they had uh, the Trail of Tears, put them under reservations, how they had passed different laws like the Dawes Act, etc., that that prevented them from kind of experiencing life as they wanted. Uh, and, and what was the result of that? The ghost dance, and then forcibly putting them into reservations and the, having their kids removed from them and put into these uh, schools to, uh, to eliminate any sort of cultural traditions they have as Native Americans. And so there were many people who were writing in magazines and newspaper articles to, for the American people to see what injustice, injustices that were happening to them. So just as we're having major changes at the macro scale of, of changing government, and then changing the opportunities for the roles of women, changing the opportunities for, the, for African American, and then the Native American, we're now gonna be talking about, uh, they're not happy with just those reforms on a, on a, on a outside level, on, on an exterior level. Now they're beginning to kind of say, there's some problems with our society because people's hearts aren't in the right place or they're, uh, they're not behaving in the correct means. And so these middle class reformers sought to impose their standards of behavior on sadly, um, often the immigrant populations, whether it matter if you're the Chinese there in San Francisco in their opium dens or the Irish immigrants there in New York City, they believe that the root of the disorder that were happening in those towns was because of their immoral behaviors. And so you have the wish Christian temperance movement uh, passing, you then begin them attacking the use of alcohol. And ironically, in the 18th Amendment, you begin seeing that alcohol was outlawed. How did it get passed? Well, uh, we have at 1914 uh, and 1919, you have World War I taking in this play and they had a food ration things. And how do you make hard alcohol? You use wheat and corn. And those are things that they argue could be gone to our soldiers. Why are we using those types of things instead of sending them off to food? And so you had a lot of people in the South, ironically, where a lot of those whiskeys and bourbons are made that were part of this 
very conservative effort to eliminate the opportunity for people to get alcohol and under the disguise of, well, we're saving food for the soldiers when really they probably had other agendas uh, with that. So we'll return back to the 18th Amendment in subsequent uh, times as well. Uh, at the same time, um, in the big cities, there are prostitution uh, rings happening. Um, not, like, not like what happens here, even in the States today, a sad thing. And so there was an act passed, the Man Act, that was used to kind of monitor um, how white women were allegedly being abused and taken across state lines, kind of like a pimp does. And, the, you know, the whole, I don't need to go into detail on that. But, um, and so this Pat Lap Act was passed. Now, ironically, and continually reflective of America during those times is it was only for the white woman. It was not for the African-American woman or uh, an immigrant type of woman situation. And so uh, there's a side story about a boxer that I don't have time to get into, but you should read on your own and how this boxer, African-American boxer who beat another white boxer, um, this man act was used to kind of uh, keep him quiet and it was just kind of a sad situation during this time. So we need to recognize that um, these social gospel people, these conservative fundamentalists were beginning to use their progressive stances, not only change government, but also to have a greater influence on the daily lives of everyday type of people. And um, one last thing that we'll talk about, and, and this is a woman here that uh, is another strong feminist who believe that many of the social societal ills come from um, women producing more children and often because there were no health contraceptives during that time for safe sex um, she was a big advocate for giving um, like opening clinics for women in poor neighborhoods so that way they don't have a lot of unwanted pregnancies that then could turn into unwanted and illegally given abortions uh, during this time. And so Margaret Sanger became a, focal a very vocal critic uh, in terms of why the government was not being responsible in giving these women's, women the opportunity to do this. Now, she also had some other weird, quirky, quirky things and where she, she was believing this eugenics thing and that was big in this time of science and how, you know, the Anglo-Saxon race, Anglo race was the ultimate race. Even our own Teddy Roosevelt president would be pat talking about this, but I'll talk about him in subsequent time periods or uh, lectures. But she basically says, ooh, eugenics would help us to have less immigrants having kids so that way those of us who are better will have an opportunity to procreate more. In fact, you should be procreating more, you Anglo-Saxons, than the rest of them. Uh, so just a weird, quirky thing that Margaret Sanger advocated for on one hand, a deeply feminist thing to control the womb, but on the other hand, using it as part of a eugenics project for American history. So to summarize, we need to recognize that there are tremendous reforms going on. They're called the progressives, and they're going after the politics and power of, of Washington, D.C. But at the same time, these progressives are going into our social and personal lives and trying to dictate how things uh, should unfold into those situations. Well, go out and be good humans um, and uh, be good, Golden Bears. <laughs>